dear friends and comrades, this is uh, another fantastic interview of uh, without censorship, bez censury, wbrew censurze, internet independent uh, channel. Our today's guest is uh, Dr. Tuomas Malinen, associate professor at the University of Helsinki and the co-founder and uh, main analytic of the research service on geopolitics and economics, GNS Economics. Welcome, dear Professor Malinen. Thank you. Nice to be here. First of all, uh, I would like to make some comparison because uh, uh, we all know that Poland is uh, considered to be one of the main warmongers in the pre present international situation. But uh, when you look from Polish perspective, uh, you, you would notice that in Poland, is, um, we are given Finland example as um, something which should uh, support any um, attempts to, 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 to be more active in the, in the mm. Ukrainian crisis. Uh, mm. We are, we are told that let's look for uh, the Finns. Uh, they just joined the NATO. They um, left their neutrality. So they consider that Russia is uh, aggressive as well. Uh, they are preparing to the war. Uh, they could be our uh, renowned uh, ally. They can fight exactly like during the winter uh, war mm. and so on. And, and other, of course, historical examples. We had a lot of about, you know, Finnish uh, snipers from the continuation war and all these historical uh, stories of, of historical politics uh, is uh, now on top in Polish media uh, as well. But no one remembers why. That, that's actually rather interesting that, you know, the Finnish, you know, okay. Yeah. And But only one historical uh, example, one historical um, mechanism is totally forgotten. No one remembers about the Finlandization. No one remembers mm. how and why uh, the Finns in the 70s, in the 80s, that thanks to the Juho Pasikivi or, or Uho Kekkonen, uh, you had, you know, um, beneficial um, from the from the both sides. You, you could you could mm -hmm. get, get all benefits because um, of being between the West and the East. So what has happened? What has changed in Finland that you, well, for, well seems to have forgot that uh, too? Well, first of all, I have to ask, do your... Does your media mention that we actually lost both wars to Russia? Of Today, course. Not. Of course. And we, we lost 12% of our landmass. So it was a uh, like winter war was a, 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 a de defense war against the aggression of, of, of Russia or the Soviet Union, and, and the, um, which basically came arose from the, the military. Uh, the, uh, uh, Rip and Rob, forgot the name anyway, but the secret pact, which basically divided Finland or Europe in in uh, kind of um, trenches of of Russia or Soviet Union and Germany. So Russia really tried to you know take what what she wanted, and there were different ter territorial claims, and also the uh, the Petsamo had the uh, uh, had the most uh, the biggest. Um, Damn, it's the worst of worst today, but the biggest concentration of nickel in Europe, which was needed for weapons. But anyway, so we lost both wars. But the point, what I have been making for a while, is that we knew when we need to raise the white flag. So we knew when we, we understood that when we need to stop fighting and pursue for peace. And it's quite and unfathomable that in the current European system, Ukraine has clearly lost. We we have no no like exact knowledge of the um, of the losses of the uh, armed forces of Ukraine, but they are massive. Some say they could be even half a million men gone. Some say two two hundred thousand, but it's a lot. It's a massacre. And all the kind of the independent reports from Ukraine tell the same story. That the losses are massive, the men are gone, the uh, 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 cemeteries are full, all this. And why this warmongering continues, I, it, it's really difficult to fathom what is going on. And Finland is, is um, it's, it's kind of a pinnacle of this, because we, we had so long and so very prosperous relationship with Russia, first Soviet Union and then Russia. So Finland kind of cemented her position 
alongside this military giant, which was the Soviet Union at times, uh, at that time. Uh, through, you know, the perseverance uh, in the wars, and then also not making ourselves a threat. And, you know, the Eastern trade was really big, um, big part of Finnish industrialization on, 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 our, on our rapid economic uh, ascent, because the Soviet Union was under um, sanctions from many directions, from many Western European countries and the US, but we had none. So we traded with them really, and we had a really high uh, share of export. I think it was 25% of all of our exports went to Russia at some point or Soviet Union. So this, was, this is the background. And now suddenly, one war in the, the uh, uh, like southeast corner of Europe in Ukraine has completely changed this. Well, they, they, the wars in uh, like Georgia, uh, uh, Abkhazia, and and they, um, Chechnya, they didn't. There were no problems. Russia did what it has has been doing for over five hundred years. It defends its borders. They have been fighting, like in in Finland, for example, in the Karelian Eastmuts, which is basically our route to Saint Petersburg. They have been fighting there since 1475, at least, the Swedish Empire and the Russian Empire. And the, the Russian wars along her borders are nothing new, like the U.S. like the U.S. wars. Uh, in every country, basically, what the U.S. current U.S administration finds important. U.S. fights there, and Russia fights along these borders. So just today, it was yesterday, but anyway, and we didn't, uh, during the past few days, our prime minister actually said that Russia is, uh, is preparing for a long war against Europe. These are completely unprecedented words coming from a prime minister of Finland. And just two weeks ago, our Minister of Defense, Antti Häkkinen, said that Russia is a threat to all dem democratic states in Europe. And this is other nonsense. Russia has never been, um, let, me, let me correct, Russia has been the same threat for Europe for at least 500 years. Nothing has changed except when Russia, when, when there was a Soviet Union, it could have invaded parts of Europe and, and hold it. That's a fact. That, that they had the military and economic capacity to do it. Russia, you know, that when, when they took the Crimea and Peninsula, they, they, they had a, um, I forgot the name of the fund, but they had two big funds, like about $500 billion in these funds. And the, crime, the, the annexation of Crimea ate through the first one. Now, the second one is halved basically, because of this war in, on, on, in East, eastern Ukraine. There is no way, economically, or even military, that Russia could take a larger part of Europe. And it doesn't serve, it does not serve any kind of the, um, the, the um, aims of, of those, you know, of Kremlin and those backing it. It absolutely makes no sense make Russia bigger threat now than it has always been, which is, you know, it, it, and Russia usually reacts when there is something, you know, it, it sees an opportunity or then someone attacks to Russia. These are basically how the wars, you know, come to be. And Finland, we have been, we, we, the relations, relations with Russia have been so good for so long. So this is, I would say that the, the only explanation for this, like the change of, of tune, let's say, in Finland, is that this is a deliberate act of escalation, which I don't know what group or power faction of whoever is pushing for this, but this is deliberate. And it has been, you know, it's because from historical perspective, from an econ economic perspective, from military perspective, this makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, well, I think that it's, 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 it's very important for you, also for, for Polish people to understand, because, of course, not supporting uh, uh, the politics of Polish government in uh, any aspect, 
especially mm. the, 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 the Eastern policy. Uh, I could understand that some Polish people could uh, feel threatened by the by by the events uh, happening just around the border, just just in the Ukraine. Uh, even considering how big this country really mm. is and, and how far in the in the in the kilometers it's from the Polish border. But I can understand that's our neighbor. But mm. uh, what is for, to, for for Finland or for for Sweden uh, to, to 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 get into exactly into the middle of the of the international struggle, which is well not related to any kind of of of, of Scandinavian uh, mm. affairs, uh, mm. because now, as I understand uh, all these speeches and and and, uh, and discussions in in, in Finland. Uh, I can see that uh, that your initiative or Finnish initiative to get uh, NATO installation on the on the Finnish territory, uh, or even to to invite some nuclear weapon on the Finnish territory. Uh, so uh, uh, Finnish government would prefer uh, to became a treat for the Russia just two hundred kilometers from the Saint Petersburg. Uh, mm. and so, I'm not sure if it's really fact that Finland, you know, is uh, afraid of the of the war treat, or if you just you know stri striving for that, you, you you try to invite the war treat to the to the to the Finnish borders. I think that is very dangerous play. It is, but do you know, do you know that we have the biggest artillery in Europe? So the thing is that NATO needs us if if it's gonna wage a war against Russia. We have the, well, with Poland, the largest army also, and definitely the most effective one, you know. So NATO desper desperately needed Finland, but only if the aim is to wage war against Russia. If NATO would be a defense alliance, it would not talk about taking Ukraine as a member, which is a clear red line for Moscow, or, you know, taking Finland. Because it has Finland has been a, a kind of a buffer zone, neutral zone between the West and the East, like you mentioned, for a long, very long time. And we have played it role so well. So why why we need to change this? I think the only explanation is that NATO has become or is possibly always been an aggressor. And the funny thing is that Finland was ascended as a full member of NATO in uh, on the 9th of April, which is the exactly same date when the first North Atlantic, Atlantic Treaty was signed in 1949. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it signals something. And, the, and what we really need to think here, we need to think in terms that whoever is actually driving NATO and the NATO leadership is waging war against Russia. And that's, we know from history that has been extremely detrimental for Europe every time. So it's really like time for the ordinary people to wake up what is going on. If you look at the comments, like, for example, in my, um, in my newsletter, what, our, what Antti Häkkänen has said, our, our defense minister or our prime minister, you understand, you, need, you understand that something really strange is going on. And I fear... And if the ordinary people do not wake up and start to demand that we start peace negotiations and not rearming ourselves to the teeth against Russia, we will see another major European war, which will most likely turn into a world war. And the mo motives behind this are really difficult to find, but it, it they could relate to the... Um, military industrial complex uh, Eisenhower President Eisenhower of the US warned about in his for, for speech in, in 1962 but there is something really fishy going on in the background because this is not anything that we have been doing with Russia over the past two years has not been beneficial for the European populace you know cutting the energy, all that. We, Europe has been saved by the weather gods now two, two, two winters in a row from, from a massive energy crisis. Germany, the, the former industrial hub of Europe, is, is in massive decline because of the energy uncertainty. And all bad things are coming. And the thing here to remember, 
when we draw the lines here is that Ukraine is to Russia what Mexico is to the United States. My American friend, who is by no means a, a, a leftist, said to me a year ago, a little over a year ago, that if Mexico would be joining a military alliance with Russia and would be selling Texas, there would be no Mexico, no more. These two states, nuclear super states, act to, at the very, the very same way what comes to when they need to defend their interests. U.S. and Russia play the, have been playing the same geopolitical, geopolitical game for a long time. Russia even longer, but it's all the same. And if we do not understand or acknowledge what the U.S. would have done if Ukraine and Mexico would have changed place, you do not you do not understand the conflict, and you are just a pawn in this crazy game, crazy game of our elite to create a, uh, a another European war. Yeah, well, I would say that we can also use facts to 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 to, to give this comparison even more direct. Just it was. Uh, several months ago, I remember when America, American administration uh, announced that um, Washington never accept a Chinese uh, military base on the Salomon Islands. Yeah, so mm. so uh, even if 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 it means uh, uh, any kind of intervention, so they, any mm. kind of intervention, yeah. and the Department of State announced. Mm. We all remember historically from about the Grenada, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, I, I believe that NATO installation in Finland would be something more similar to the to the uh, Cuba missiles crisis so in the sixties. So, so that would be quite similar. <laughs> Yeah, the thing is that there is actually one base which are, on the map I have seen, which is right in the border, in the, in the northern part of Finland, right in the border with Russia, very, very close to Murmansk. And we have had this, there is no other word to describe it, but batshit crazy discussion about bringing nuclear weapons to Finnish soil. Like, like you said, we, we, there's 200 kilometers from our border to St. Petersburg. And... You know, we we you, they can shoot nuclear um, missiles from from planes, from artillery, or whatever. If there would be nuclear weapons in Finnish soil, all Russian countermeasures would be useless. Everything, and it will. It Russia cannot allow it to happen. So then, if that is going to come to be, Russia needs Russia will, or actually needs to act preemptively. And this is like, the, like you mentioned, this is the Cuban Missile Crisis all over again, because there is the nuclear deterrence. Is there is like two major components. Other is that you have these things that then carry these nuclear weapons, and then there's the ones you have uh, made to protect your country. And these are two parts, and and you cannot you cannot distangle them, and the U.S. will not distangle them. The the Russia will not. This time. So you have these two key elements. And you, if you do not understand those, you don't understand nuclear deterrence. And Finland absolutely cannot have any nuclear weapons. And if NATO tries to bring, bring them here, or even if our administration calls from them here, it's a treason. It's a high treason because it will start, in, uh, start a war here. And I hope that, like, like what? What, they, what? The one thing, you know, they, they some in Finland speak about Poland, is that you will be the ones to, that move in to Western Ukraine. And you know, it seems that it's like there's Poland and there's Finland now on the on the front line. You know, a new president said that it, we're on the front line with Russia, even though we are not in a war. We're not, and there's absolutely no like bad blood between Finnish and Russian general populace. There's there's nothing. So this is this is politician made. This is a made up war or made up threat of a war. Yeah, well, I would say that uh, it's absolutely, absolutely right that uh, we are be the, the the front lines of the of the NATO war against Russia. Is that will be both the Finns and 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 the Poles uh, all together because of the of the potential of our of our societies, potential of our armies 
uh, which is mm. much higher in, the, in in case of Finland than in Poland. But I would like to ask about yeah the, one more internal problem from the from the mm. uh, Finnish politics because I try to follow the the, the, the debate about the about the NATO and about the neutrality uh, in both Scandinavian countries and uh, I well I had an impression that there was no debate at all so that would be you know just just one side. Uh, everything was absolutely clear. Yeah, we have to join yeah, the United yeah, because of because yeah. of the yeah. because Russia is is aggressive, uh, and uh, I can see that of course as after following the speeches of of uh, Hakkinen, uh, I've read some uh, very similar uh, uh, speeches of your new elected president, President Stapp, mm. which is mm. absolutely similar and really warmonger in the. In, yeah. He could be uh, absolutely po among the Polish politicians. You know, it would be no no differences between him and and, and I know Jarosław Kaczyński or, or someone like that. Mm. Uh, and well, even the the, the 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 more you know Western skeptic parties like Power to the People now accepted uh, pro NATO positions. So so it was mm. uh, even in even in Sweden with very very weak and, and low level of the of the public debate, some pacifist movement well. Uh, at least uh, had to say something about uh, mm. against about the Green mm. Party of, of of Sweden voted against. Of course, after that they changed the mm. position, but voted against joining. Mm. But in Finland, it was absolutely quiet. So, so yeah. uh, is the, for the for the for the Finns for the society uh, is this uh, well uh, undebatable problem? Is there is no other choice than than than, than to, to follow this uh, more longer line? No, I think the um, I think. Uh... And this is actually how many Finns now feel that we were tricked into NATO on the on the pre prelude of fear. So there was this fear, and it was used to get us into NATO. There's actually the now former president Niinistö, Salo Niinistö, said in uh, it was the fourth of February in two thousand twenty-two or something like that. He said that the NATO this uh, issue is so large that we need to ask the people. And after just three months, it has completely changed that you can use these gallops to, you know, to justify this. But we had we had no debate. We had just one side, like you said. We had no debate. It was completely buried. And it, it, there was a massive propaganda operation actually going that everyone who tried to raise the issue was immediately um, you know, attacked. In, in the social media, anywhere, you, you were Russian troll, you were Putin is all that. And it has, I think that there was a central nature on it. It has to be. So it was it was a controlled thing. And the thing is that <laughs> my former friend, our current Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, Elena Walton, and said in, I think it was April uh, uh, 2022, when some journalist asked her about the NATO thing, and he just said that, she just said that, it's it's already decided. Well, she has an engineer background, so he, I, I know, I, I'm, I did. We were friends for several years, so I know him on her, know her in that respect. And he just, he's an engineer. He just blurbs out the truth at times. So I'm, I'm thinking that that was the truth that back then, and uh, like that, I don't know what faction in Finland and in Europe is driving this. But I think what she said then was the truth. It was decided over our heads. And this was not the first time in Finland, for example, the re recovery fund, we, we, I actually led the campaign against it. And it, it was a, uh, but at the end, uh, the central right, part, central right party, which was a very key, they, they, had, they held a key position. It, they took really drastic actions to get it through. With the corona policies, we weren't asked all that. So there are these issues that seem to be like decided over our heads, and then the NATO was one of those. And the really troubling question everybody should be thinking now is why that is. Why they needed Finland in NATO now? And I think there's there can be only one answer, and is that NATO is going to wage war against Russia.
Yeah, and that reaches to the uh, to your um, absolutely brilliant uh, analysis. I believe that uh, all our viewers could find it on your uh, blog on Substack. I yep. really advise to 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 follow and to to, to subscribe because it because it's um, also for, for for people with the without economical background is also very clarifying the situation on the on the global market. And Thank I you. just finished. Uh, Couple of minutes before our interview, uh, your final part of your of your uh, uh, possible uh, end game scenarios for for the um, Ukrainian. I, I would call them likely. And I believe, <laughs> yeah, I believe that it is very very interesting and uh, something which is um, uh, well giving some conclusions for for for, for the people something to to, to think about. Uh, yeah. So, what are the these possible scenarios for 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 the Ukraine, in your opinion? Yeah, well, I think basically I, I concentrated on the first first um, the first part of the of the entry was about mostly about Russia and NATO, the relationship, the, how Russia act, Russia actually acts, you know, very predictably, and the erratic or or the dangerous uh, uh, um, actor here now is the NATO. So the four scenarios, or I have to, I have just checked that I had this on the table. So the first one is the overruling majority, which leads to peace. And in uh, with this, I mean that the people wake up to the threat currently created by NATO and, of course, subsequently by Russia. But they understand that NATO either makes these cataclysmic uh, errors in, you know, by crossing the deliberately or not deliberately, but crossing the red lines of Moscow. And they just say that you cannot do this. They rise against the, this war machine and war monger and say, we don't want any war against Russia. So that's the overall majority, the first scenario. The second was uh, second is the immovable majority, which is act actually a concept um, created by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, which is there is a, a very small percentage, percentage of populace which are so immovable, so uh, so actual, uh, so totally unyielding that they will push through, you know, whatever the agenda they hold. And in this case, it's the um, well, it's it's the small percentage of war mongers in all over Europe and the Rus Russophobes. And if they get their will through, whatever path NATO is following, whether it's the erratic or the aggressor, we will lead to a wider it will lead to a wider conflict. And then there are the actual two scenarios which which could describe or which I think are the only ones really can explain the actions of NATO. First one is the re regime change in Russia. And I consider this to be the most likely one because NATO has been slowly increasing their effort in uh, in Ukraine uh, and, and their, um, you know, their kind of investments there. And the pinnacle was last summer. And they were the, the Ukrainian counteroffensive. And it was followed by the attempted coup of Yevgeny Prigozhin. And it seems to me that the idea was that the counterattack counter of, the, of the AFU will deliver a devastating blow to Russian forces, after which Prigozhin goes to Moscow, starts his march to Moscow with the, you know, the Russian mentality collapsing, uh, heavy losses and all that. None of that happened. But when you start to plan and e exercise a coup, you really cannot stop it. You have to go all the way. And Brigosin had to go all the way and with the very great personal cost, of course. And I think he was supported, at least, if not even directed by some uh, Western um, um, intelligence offices or institutions. So I think that's, if, if you look or put all the pieces together, this is the most likely scenario that the NATO is currently planning. And in the future, it's just how, where, where could this lead to is that NATO, NATO can really start this rearmament race. You know, they, they tr try to draw the resources of Russia and collapsing it from inside out, like what happened in the 1980s. And then, or then they engulf these wars alongside Russian border with the hope of de destabilizing a large part of Russia, which would lead to Putin regime to collapse. 
but we'll see. And of course, there is the, the fourth, the worst scenario, which is World War Three and the um, eventual nuclear holocaust it would be it will most likely bring. And to this, there are like two options that the NATO is aggressively pursuing to gain control of the Russian resources or uh, um, what was the second one? Uh, but anyway, so they are ag aggressively pushing for a, a, a regime change in Russia to gain control of, of Russian assets or whatever. And they just make miscalculations and nuclear war erupts. But then there is the most dangerous scenario, which is that there is some very powerful faction within NATO or in the background that is actually pushing for this nuclear confrontation. I don't consider it to be likely, but it's possible. And in they could just think that there is in this really in their really crazy thinking that they could control a nuclear war, just that that it, it would affect just the right amount of damage to the human populace or whatever. And this is like the the, the craziest scenario, the the scenario of craziest. And I don't think this is. I, I consider it to be very unlikely, but we have to also consider that. But from these four scenarios, which you can actually you can find from from my newsletter, just Google my name and newsletter, and you will find it. Only one will lead to peace, and it's the first one where the general populace says, "No, we don't want this." And I fear that if if the if the people do not wake up for this threat, we will see another European war. And I think that one of the um, one one of the factors which um, could be uh, suggesting that it's, it's, it's unfortunately this 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 free uh, war scenario are more probable for for, for Europe is that uh, together with the with the with the war treat with the global um, uh, conflict treat uh, we have also still ongoing. Uh, uh, treat of the another great economic or global uh, financial crisis, uh, mm. much more dangerous, much more destructive than the one from the uh, 2008 2011. Uh, mm. As I follow, of course, also your your economical analysis, and uh, yeah, you pointed that uh, the problem is that the banks too big to fall from the from the 15 years ago now are even bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, we have now not only the financial banking system bubble, but uh, we have bubbles almost everywhere in the in the in this uh, present stage of of capitalism. And this time, uh, financial crisis could um, be destructive not only for the for the for the banks for the, even for the short time, but for the whole financial system still based on the U.S. Uh, treasuries, securities, and and dollars. So that would be something mm -hmm. that would be yeah. more similar to the to the great crisis of the. Of the of the thirties, uh, mm. how possible uh, do you think it is, and what kind of uh, time perspective uh, you would find uh, probable for, for for this scenario? Yeah, the, the, what we and I, we are GNS economics, and I, I fear the most is the repetition of the Great Depression. And the thing is that the banking system is is very highly levered uh, in both in in deposits. And loans, basically, uh, it, it, they they are if you know deposit run deposits in the U.S. banking system have grown really really high, and deposit runs is one that destroys banks. And but there's also the uh, the, the massive loan losses which are now coming to light from the commercial real estate of the United States, and these can create a a, a contagion in the U.S. banking system which would lead. It to collapse. And another thing is that European banking sector has been on the, well, in, not in a good shape for a well in very long time, because the banks were allowed, the big European banks were allowed to hide the toxic assets, you know, the CDOs, the, all, the, all those things in the, in the great financial crisis. They allowed them to hide them in the balance sheets by removing the mark to market rule, which means that they don't have to try to guess even guess the price of, of these products in markets. They can just 
use them as have them in the balance sheet as a, as the, the price they purchased them and just pretend they have value and the, these assets have now rotted in the um uh, in the in the european banking system for quite long time quite, quite long time and to top of to top this <laughs> we have china which is the most levered economy in the history of humanity so massive amounts of debt hidden uh, in the play, in plain sight but also hidden in the shadow banking sector and the collapse of china is now ongoing they just tried to hide it with massive debt stimulus which doesn't really be doesn't isn't that isn't really effective anymore but they try to hide it still they try to control it so we are in the collapse already and the question is of course how long will it take how long can these governments keep supporting it and it may take surprisingly long still we have the uh, we have the assumption that some banking system issues will arise in this month or the next and but there are still possibilities for the Federal Reserve, European authorities, all that to stop that. But here, and but here, the politics comes in too. So uh, the Biden administration is running a massive fiscal stimulus program. So where when are they going to end it? If Joe Biden loses to Donald Trump, which is very likely in November, they might just cut it. And then the U.S. economy will tumble. And another thing is that, you, that the, during the current times, there was a massive amounts of what we in the industry call excess savings, which means that households had these savings through the because the economy was closed, and um, because governments were the federal government was giving these stimulus checks, so and they had no place to uh, consume them or to invest them. So they just saved them. And the saving rate increased very high uh, uh, um, above its long-term trend. And then they started to decline when the you know, household started to eat through these savings. And according to the recent estimates, they're gone. So the excess, and the U.S. economy was heavily supported of the excess savings because there was a lot of them. The estimates vary, but they are in the hundreds of billions, if not even a trillion. And they are also running out now. So we are kind of moving, or we are in. We are probably entering, or have already entered, something of an end game for the economy too, because the global economy has been run by supported by massive debt issuance and leverage for a long time. And we're coming to the end of that. And if you want to go really conspirational here or conspirational theory, theorist here, you think, you assume that because the governments and the elite knows that the collapse is coming, you enact the war. You, you make, create a threat. You create a threat that you can, you know, issue more debt and, and, prepare the populace for hard times because we need to re eradicate this evil from the world. And this is how it looks, it's going. But of course, I cannot be, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but this is, this, this looks, if you, if you take a really high look of all of this, this has happened for at least a five, year, five years, you cannot but the thing, the possibility that this is a one big conspiracy to whatever aim we don't know but it's it looks very it's it looks like a big very big conspiracy theory if you if you take it to the very high level and although i don't still consider it to be the most likely option i consider it to be even rather likely we at least have to consider everyone needs to consider the possibility that the elites global elites are conspiring against us and there's a historical example right next to you, exactly, and very much it very much touches you. So, in the 1920s, uh, the German elite were really worried that they would lose their power to this newly invented uh, uh, social uh, social system or societal system called democracy, and they thought that we need the authoritarian leader, and they started they found one and started supporting 
and that man was Adolf Hitler. So elites can do really cataclysmic mistakes also. And we really need to think what are they planning now? Because by the looks of it, like what is happening to Finland, what is happening in Poland, what is happening in Ukraine, what is happening in the US, is nothing good. Yeah, well, I, maybe it doesn't sound very optimistic, but uh, I believe that uh, a lot of our viewers uh, now uh, are absolutely sure that, especially after the COVID pandemic uh, experience, that we know that this uh, popular meme, that the conspiracy theorist is the man who is right just a uh, couple months before the others, hmm. is absolutely true. So, so, so you know, we don't have to be uh, optimistic. But that we just need to be realistic and to think hmm. uh, the reality uh, how it is, uh, and to predict the future, uh, not because of the of, of to treat people, but maybe to secure before that 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 bad scenarios. Uh, okay. yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Manuel. It was absolutely a pleasure for me to uh, host you here. I hope that we return to these uh, conversations in the future in our debates um, on our channel. So thank you very much once again. Thank you. And uh, dear friends and comrades, uh, please uh, follow us uh, on YouTube and X on Telegram as well in the free language version. I remind in Polish, uh, English and uh, Russian as well. Uh, you can subscribe our YouTube channel. And I also, of course, advise to uh, subscribe to the our uh, noble guest, uh, Professor Malinen's uh, newsletter as well. That's very important and very brilliant uh, analysis of the of the economical and geopolitical situation. So please. Uh, let's meet again and let's create the better scenarios for the world. Thank you very much and see you again. Thank you.